And good evening, church. Glad to see you here tonight. If you've got your Bibles open, uh, you might want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Tonight we are going to be discussing uh, how to talk with folks about homosexuality. How to talk to folks about homosexuality. This is part of our series where we're talking about some things that are really hard to talk about sometimes. Uh, that may be very challenging for us. Uh, and, and the way we maneuver around that is really important, especially as God's people, because we want to represent God. We want to represent God and His Word the best of our ability, and we want to do it in a godly way. And we want to do it in a way that stands for what God stands for, but in also in a way that is going to draw people to become godly people, as much as that possibility exists. How to talk to folks about homosexuality is one of those things that might be really tense and difficult to talk about. I know this because I've watched the conversations take place. I remember being on a mission trip. I can't remember which island we were on, but it's one of those mission trips when the, uh, there was probably three different generations represented overall. And I remember there was a young person and he was talking about a comedian, Ellen, that was super, super funny. And he was laughing at something that Ellen said. And man, he was, he was going at it. And you know what? It was actually very funny. But as he was saying this, there was another person there of a different generation, and she turned and looked at him and says, don't you ever say a woman like that is funny. And he was put back, and he's like, but it was a funny joke. Now maybe he was handling it way too lightly and didn't appreciate all the impact that she had had in shifting culture with regard to homosexuality. And at the same time, maybe... The person who freaked out a little bit at him even acknowledging that she was a funny comedian handled it a little too harshly, put him off. His desire to be around her diminished incredibly, and there was unnecessary tension. Why? Because you've got two people on two different sides. They're on the same side. They're all members of the church. But even in that context, there was tensions between them. Both had some ground to give in there. Why do we need to talk about homosexuality? Well, because it's becoming something pretty common in our culture and in our lives, probably in ways that some of us would never, ever expect. And 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you may never have dreamed it would be what it is today. And yet there's some people today, this is all they've ever known or ever seen. Almost like it's required to be on certain TV programs or insert that lifestyle in a particular movie. And there's a normalcy to it, and that scares some people, and maybe rightly so. It becomes too common for others, um, and it's worth talking about. Because in the midst of that, what is most important is, what does the Bible say? And if I'm a Christian, that's got to be the primary thing I'm concerned about. What does the Bible say? And when I engage in that conversation, how do I represent God best? How do I speak where God speaks? That's got to be the critical point of this. And with an attitude that reflects God the best as well. This is what's going to bring us to 1 Timothy chapter 1. There's this interesting thing that Paul says here. And of course this is one of those uh, famous sections of scriptures that talks about a variety of sins. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But it's what Paul says after that that I find particularly interesting. That we'll read first and then go back and kind of engage with this on what the Bible says. Paul says this in chapter 1, verse 12, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul is not separating himself too far from the, the, the tyranny of sin. He recognizes what his life was before Jesus and what he's dedicated himself to because of Jesus. He understands as a godly man that his purpose has got to be the same as Jesus' purpose, to be mindful of sinners, to love sinners, and help them to obtain the same mercy that he experienced himself. 
He's owning his own sin in the midst of this, appreciating and recognizing what he came out of. But the goal was salvation. The goal was to find freedom from sin. That's a pretty important perspective to have. When we look at one another, and when we look into the world around us, even for homosexuals, which may be difficult for some people to process because it's just not part of life in general. And it might be difficult for some people to think about because it seems so foreign and so vile and it seems like a thing that you, you have difficulty with. I get it. I get it. But be mindful of how that plays with all the other sins. Go back to verse 8. Look at what he's saying here in verse 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners. And he's about to list the ungodly and his sinners. For the unholy and the profane, for the murderers of fathers, the murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. The word sodomite there is a clear reference to homosexuality. What's interesting though is when you look at it in the original language, it is a peculiar word. I can't even, I will try to say it later when we get to the discussion group, then you all can laugh, but then I will challenge you to say it as well. And if you say it with greater skill, then by all means come to the microphone and share with it. But it's a complicated word, a very complicated word. And it's interesting because it's not a common word. It's like Paul has taken these two ideas that he has gotten from the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, which was a very common verse in uh, opposition to homosexuality, one that a lot of people go first and uh, go to first. But I think there's better places for, we, for us to go as New Testament Christians to start with. And he's put these two words together, and the words simply mean a man who lies with another man. It's literally what it means. He's joined two Greek words together, and it seems like it probably came from Leviticus 18.22. He's saying it's sinful for a man to lie with another man, as you would with a woman. Sinful. It's in the same list as the profane and the unholy. It's in the same list as those that are ungodly. This is one passage in the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit, committed to text by Paul that we have preserved for us today that's explaining something that is clearly wrong. And it's okay to say that. It's wrong. According to God's Word, it is a sin. Now, how we discuss that and how we talk about that with other people, that's the trick. That's the trick. Because it would be easy for us to say, it's a sin, I want nothing to do with it, and I push them away. But that's not really the gospel message, is it? The gospel is for all, and the gospel is for sinners to repent and to come out of their sin. The gospel point is for people to have salvation. The gospel point is for us not to isolate ourselves into a church building and pretend nothing else is going on in the world. The gospel point is for us to go out, share that gospel message, that you can have freedom from sin, that you can have a different life, more meaningful, more pleasing to God, and we can fill our pews with people who had been guilty of sin just as we were in the past. Maybe not the same sin, but sin nonetheless. Sometimes we close ourselves off in that. We treat everyone else as other, other, other. Paul's doing a job here where he's pointing out like, well, no, I was a blasphemer. I was a blasphemer. And he goes on to call himself the chief of sinners. The way that he's handling the situation is ownership of his own sins, but not, and and being grateful for the freedom he has in Jesus, but he's recognizing their sin out there. He's not making excuses for it, but his goal and his ambition is for that sin to be put away and for there to be new life in Jesus. That's an interesting perspective. That's one thing to think about as we talk about how, how to discuss homosexuality. What is our end game here? If it's just to point fingers and condemn, I don't know that I can say that that's biblical in and of itself. If it's just so we feel uncomfortable and I need to let people know that I, you know, I feel uncomfortable about a thing and, and shame, shame, I, 
Can't say that that's exactly biblical. But if it's to say a thing is wrong because the Bible says it's wrong, but it's also to say, I care about that person's soul and I want to see them saved, then that's a discussion that we need to have. Not to make excuses, not to pretend, and not to put someone so far off that by our own definitions we've excluded them from the gospel. I get it. This is a difficult conversation. And we need to have the conversation because it's changed over time. It used to be you may never have even met a person who proclaimed to be a homosexual, let alone who was openly so. Used to be. Some of you may have experienced that. At the same time today, when I taught this class with the young people, and I said, how many of you know someone who is gay or a homosexual or LGBTQIA plus whatever? Most raised their hands. I said, raise your hand if you know more than one. Most raised their hands. It's something that we see today. We need to know how to navigate it biblically, not avoid it. We're not cowardly people. We're not scared people. We're people of the word. So let us stand in the word. That's why we need to discuss these things. We're going to close up now and give us time so we can have a discussion. The point of where we're going to go tonight in the discussion is kind of talk more about the biblical perspective and some of the pushback people have said uh, against what the Bible says. And I'd like to hear, obviously it's a discussion, so we want to open up the conversation to hear some of the things that you've encountered from the biblical perspective. Next week we'll get into the weeds a little bit more, like how do you navigate this in the world? For example, if I've got next door neighbors that are homosexual and they invite me over for a barbecue, do I go? Is that different? How do I handle that situation as a Christian representing God? That's a good question. What if I get invited to a wedding? Do I go? Am I supporting it? It's a good question. Next week. This week we'll hit pretty heavy into the Bible and lay a foundation for it. Then, taking your advice, we'll spend some time getting into the weeds for it. We'll close out now and offer the invitation. It's a good discussion tonight. I'm excited to hear. I hope you've been praying about it. Tonight you may have been wrestling with some sin. And as we pointed out here, the whole point of the gospel and the church and, the, and our ambition is for souls to be saved, not by us, but by Jesus. The whole purpose that God has sent the Bible is we could know exactly what he wants us to do, who he wants us to be to please him. We don't have to guess. It's not a riddle. It's not a puzzle. He's put it out in very plain and simple truth. And that is what we want people to know so that you can know Jesus and you can know salvation. You can know hope and peace and forgiveness and the good life, the good life who God, who does not lie, cannot lie, has promised you. Tonight, if there's a way we can help you with that, if there's a way we can pray with you and support you, we want to do it. We really, truly do. I appreciate the hearts of the people that have come forward uh, in the last couple weeks. Even the ones that didn't do it on Sunday, but they talk later in the week. I appreciate your heart because you want to be right with God. That's something we want to support and help you in. And those of you that are so close to being a Christian, if tonight's tonight, don't hold back. Just don't hold back. And if you can't tell us why you don't want to be a Christian right now, you need to ask yourself, What's holding me back and how do I move past it? And if you need help with that, we'll be there for you as well. Whatever you need, please let us know as we stand and as we sing.